I had the experience of living in a lot of different countries. And I would live in a country in Africa or Europe or the Caribbean and just have effortlessly clear skin. And coming back to the United States, even just for a week visit, I would start to break out again. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to thank my sponsor, Cuss Cuss Skincare. Cuss Cuss products were created to assist in reducing inflammation through the wisdom naturally found in botanical ingredients. All formulas are non-GMO, 99% organic, 100% plant-based, and crafted with love to help nourish and rejuvenate your skin. One of my favorite products, their Sen Face Serum, includes CBD. I found it helps reduce redness and is so incredibly light that it's the only face serum that I'll apply in the morning to rehydrate my skin. Now, if you don't know what products are best for your skin, they offer sample packs for both their face serums and body waxes, both of which, by the way, I have purchased. There are so many different products that I love, and I know you will too. To support your journey to healthier skin, Cuss Cuss is offering Healthy Skin Show listeners 20% off your first order. All you have to do is visit them at CussCuss.com. That's K-H-U-S hyphen K-H-U-S dot com and join their email list to get access to the discount. Welcome back to episode number 16 of the Healthy Skin Show. I have to tell you guys, we have hit it big in the podcasting world. So first of all, this goes to show the power of community and giving a voice to our community because as of this episode, we have officially hit the new and noteworthy list over on iTunes. That means that iTunes has decided because you guys are leaving such great reviews and we've had so many downloads that this podcast is worth them sharing with larger audiences, which is so, so exciting. And that is a big deal because we were able to find this over on the new and noteworthy list for alternative health, as well as the one for science and medicine. This means that we are able to reach more people and help more people. And it goes to show that sharing is caring. And I deeply appreciate every single one of you for the efforts that you made. And remember, if you haven't yet gone and reviewed the podcast, I would deeply appreciate it if you've got an iTunes account. Remember to rate and review and don't stop sharing. If you're a part of any message boards or Facebook groups, please share the episodes within those to help encourage other people to read realize that there are other ways and they don't have to be stuck with just what they're getting at their doctor's office. Before we dive into today's interview all about fluoride, and yes, you're going to want to hear this because my guest is one incredibly smart cookie, I thought we would take a listener's question today. This question comes from June. Hi, I would like to know what some of the possibilities are that would cause non-rash non-hive chronic itching that would keep somebody awake at night. We have tried going without detergent to wash the clothes and it's very bad to the point where a dad cannot sleep. Thank you if you can help. June, thank you so much for asking this question. It's a good one because a lot of people do have issues with itching, but they don't have a rash, they don't have hives, and they have no idea what's going on. The first thing I would encourage you to do is you've got to look at pretty much everything else that's going on or in or surrounding in your environment, this particular person in your family, what's going on with their body. So we're looking at soaps, shampoos, conditioners, moisturizers, even those that are formulated that you buy at the store, or maybe they say they're natural, or they're even just oils. It could be something like shea butter. Yes, you can be allergic to pretty much anything, even natural products and naturally occurring products. So it's important to look at all of those. Then you want to look at allergens in the home. It could look like dust mites, pet dander, certain chemicals in your environment that you can't see or smell that may be causing the issue. It could also be foods, um, especially high histamine foods could be an issue here. Things like vinegars, alcohols, you know, beer, wine, hard alcohols, spirits, that kind of stuff. Cured meats, cheeses, especially moldy cheeses. 
anything that is basically fermented, so to speak, or pickled, those would likely be an issue. So I'm not saying with this grand list that you should assume that pretty much everything is causing the problem. That's not the case. And, you know, here's the thing. There are chemicals in our environment that you can't see. Things like formaldehyde, which is found in a lot of products in and on different things that you have no idea it's there. I'm not saying that's an issue, but you want to make sure to rule that out. So my point here is you need to look well outside of detergent. If you've literally only tried changing detergents, that's like one minuscule little step. And I know that this list is quite extensive. So what I would say is to do the following three things. First of all, I would Go back to when this started and maybe use the whole family as a way to gauge that information and say, okay, what was going on around this time? Was there something traumatic that happened? Was there high stress? Did somebody get sick? Were they exposed to certain medications or antibiotics? Any number of things, write everything down. Be as detailed and specific as possible because it's possible that sometime around that point, something changed. There was probably something fairly significant. It might not be like a giant car accident, but it could be a cold or the flu or an exposure to something specific that, you know, only you guys can figure out. Now, next, I would suggest going to your doctor and or allergist and request that they do testing, especially allergy testing on things that are in the environment. So it could be pollen, dander, food, any type of chemicals. I would even bring with you a lot of the body care products that whomever it is in the family is using and let them test them. And this will be a really great way to see and eliminate any potential factors that could be causing a problem. You also want to request that they run in blood labs, plasma histamine, and tryptase. It's spelled T-R-Y, P as in Paul, T as in Tom, A-S-E. And I'm going to share a link in the show notes to the list of labs that I generally recommend clients go get done from their family doctors. Your allergist may or may not do it. A dermatologist usually won't. The third thing that you could do is to try a supplement called quercetin and nettles. It's from Designs for Health. And I'll put a link in the show notes, making it really easy for you to find this product so that you can give it a try. And one last thing to consider here is that low thyroid can also play a role in your skin's ability to be A, moisturized and B, not be itchy. So it may be worthwhile to take a look at what's going on with this person's thyroid. If they do have a thyroid issue already, that may be indicative of saying, hey, what are the thyroid levels at and do we need to adjust medication? So my point here in sharing all of this is that unfortunately this is complicated. I'm guessing already that you know that. However, it's a good idea to go into this with a plan of attack, figure out what was going on around the time when this started, go to the doctor, get some help, get labs run, look at allergy testing and see if anything pops up. And then look outside of the system as well to say, okay, what could be causing this? Especially is this an increase in histamine in the system that is causing this intense itchiness that unfortunately can make it incredibly difficult to sleep and just to function and feel well. So I would suggest doing that. And then again, you may want to try out the quercetin and nettles product. It may be able to give whomever this is in your family at least some relief in the process of getting this done. And also too, in seeing your doctor, they may also have suggestions of what to try to help bring the itching down to at least for short-term goals, getting the sleep optimized, right? That can be the hardest thing when you start to lose sleep, when you start to lose focus and energy and all that stuff because the itching is so intense. I think a lot of times people are like, I want to do everything natural. But the truth is losing the ability to sleep can be so utterly disruptive that you then start piling problem on top of problem. And instead you want to say, okay, let's sort of prioritize here. If getting to sleep is a priority, which it always should be, getting that person's itchiness, especially at night down, will be incredibly helpful. 
So thank you again for this question. I appreciate it. And if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, I have a question I would love for Jen or one of the guests to answer, please head on over to healthyskinshow.com, scroll down and leave a voicemail in our little voicemail box and we will include your question in an upcoming episode. All right, I think it's perfect time to switch gears and start talking about how fluoride, fluoride in our water can play a huge role, not just in the development of skin rashes, but also how it can be this sort of hidden underlying trigger that my next guest has done a ton of research on, and I'm sure that you are going to find this interview incredibly eye-opening. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Natural Skin Show. Today, I have a very special guest. I always have special guests, but this guest is somebody that I met this past summer. And I will be honest with you, while I do have an admitted grudge, I guess you could say, against fluoride, she sort of t- <laughs> she takes fluoride issues to a whole new level and, and also helped me understand how fluoride can negatively impact your skin in ways that you might not think. So that's why I wanted to have her on as a guest today, because you may be looking for answers, especially for why you may have ongoing chronic adult acne. You've tried everything, and this can be one of the underlying issues. So Melissa Gallico is the author of The Hidden Cause of Acne, as well as the book called F is for Fluoride. She is a former military intelligence officer, Fulbright scholar, and intelligence specialist at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yes, that is the FBI, guys. I've already (laughs) told her she's a very smart cookie, (laughs) where she instructed classes for FBI analysts at Quantico and provided analytic support for national security investigations. She graduated with honors from Georgetown University and has a master's degree from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Melissa, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I had to ask you, because obviously... How on earth did you get so interested in fluoride? Because most people probably aren't this interested. I just like to remove it with a really good filter from my water. But tell us what got you so interested and passionate, I guess we could say against fluoride. So Yes, you could definitely definitely <laughs> say that. I, I didn't used to be that way. I always had the fluoride treatments at the dentist and I always used fluoridated toothpaste mm-hmm. and I drank fluoridated water mm-hmm. and I never really thought much of it. But I also had really bad cystic acne, chronic acne as a teenager, as an adult for almost 20 years into my mid thirties. And because of my job, I had the experience of living in a lot of different countries. And I would live in a country in Africa or Europe or the Caribbean and just have effortlessly clear skin. And coming back to the United States, even just for a week visit, I would start to break out again. And I didn't understand what it was. And I always lived in a different place in the United States. It wasn't like it was one city. And I wasn't making drastic changes to my diet. I wasn't doing anything different with my skincare routine. So it didn't make sense to me. I I would see the dermatologist living in the States and they said, oh, it's it's genetic or it's hormonal. I tried Accutane. You know, I did all of the harsh, you know, conventional treatments and they were helpful, but they didn't get to the root cause. And I did experience side effects. So this last time when I did the Fulbright in Scotland, again, I had perfectly clear skin and I thought, you know, I'm in my thirties. Okay. Maybe I outgrew acne finally. (laughs) And then I came back to the States and again, it was worse than ever. And so I just thought, okay, I'm an intelligence analyst. I am going to figure this out. And I suspected the water because I could kind of tell within a few days of going to a new location, if it was going to be one of those places. And I thought maybe it's like lead or some kind of trace element like copper or the piping or something. And I was trying to figure it out. And one of the variables was fluoride. And this resonated with me when I first heard it because I had fluoride pills as a child and I developed dental fluorosis, which is like a slight discoloring of your teeth. It's worse in certain people. Uh, Mine isn't really bad, but it's definitely there where I had a lot of fluoride exposure when I was a child. So I just tested it out by... I had already started washing my face with bottled water just because I knew, you know, it was better. It felt better on my skin. 
But I tried drinking non-fluoridated water and right away I saw such a dramatic difference. I couldn't believe it. So I thought, okay, well, there's definitely something to this. And eventually I was able to completely clear my skin by learning how to avoid fluoride, not just in my water, but it's also in the food supply for different reasons, you know, because things are made with fluoridated water. Sure. And it's also a common pesticide, which a lot of people don't know. And there's certain foods that are very high in fluoride because of this pesticide. So over time, trial and error, I completely cleared my skin. I wrote a little free PDF guide for people. Like if you have this weird allergy thing that I have, you know, here's <laughs> yeah. how to clear it. And I heard from so many people, I couldn't believe it. I just was astounded. And one woman wrote to me and said, your book saved my life. I never would have figured this out. And I just thought wow. oh, I need to write like a real book, not this like 20 page PDF thing that I'm giving away on random website. So I actually wrote a book, The Hidden Cause of Acne. It came out in May. And you can see from the reviews on Amazon, it's a real condition. It's not uncommon. It's just not commonly known about. So people don't know to eliminate fluoride from their diet to clear their skin. Hmm. That's so interesting. I mean, I know too, from my perspective, having worked as a clinical nutritionist, my big thing with fluoride is that it is in the same family. It's in the halogen family. And so fluoride and iodine look somewhat similar. And so when you are having thyroid issues, that can be one you know, even chlorine, chlorinated water, you go in a swimming pool a lot, you're exposed to chlorine, same family. And so that can start to cause issues with the thyroid. So for me, that was my main thought always. Like that's why I was sort of like, eh, fluoride, take it or leave it. My teeth are in good health. I, you know, I take good care of them. And I don't know that I buy into the idea anymore that fluoride is really the fix here. Not a dental expert, by the way, everybody. <laughs> so that, that it, we'll take it or leave it with that. But I think this is a really interesting connection between fluoride and acne. Have you found any relationships as well, even outside of acne with other skin issues? Or has anyone else commented to you or shared with you that they've had other chronic skin issues and that perhaps following this I don't know. What would you call it? A low fluoride regimen or a yeah, anti-fluoride exactly. regimen would yeah. actually help them? Yeah, actually. So I thought I had figured out this amazing thing about acne that no one had figured out before. But I recently read a book by an allergist from the 60s and he was writing about it way back then. Wow. So there is research and he was a very famous allergist. His name is George Waldbot and he's most well known for discovering the link between emphysema and smoking. Hundreds of peer reviewed articles. He wrote a lot of books and he became really interested in fluoride because he noticed that this sensitivity is very common. He huh. documented um, a lot of different dermatological conditions, including eczema, chronic hives, atopic dermatitis and acne. Interesting. So it, yeah, everyone reacts differently to it. Like you mentioned, some people, it, you know, the thyroid is really the biggest downside of fluoride. But he said that the only thing predictable about how someone responds to fluoride is that the response will be unpredictable. Like everyone responded in a different way. You made a comment that whenever you went to another country, it had to do with the water that you were drinking. You were drinking water. But then you mentioned about using bottled like a purified bottle water on your face. So is it that we just have to be mindful of the water that we consume, like drink? Or do we also have to be mindful of a topical application of that type of water as well? So should someone say, be mindful of the fact that if they're taking a shower and they're having this issue, they have to get also like a shower filter? Yeah, it's really hard to filter fluoride from your shower. Most of those filters won't eliminate fluoride because okay. it's just a high output. It's a lot easier to eliminate it from your drinking water. I was not able to clear my skin completely until I moved to a non-fluoridated house. But I, I think that's because I hadn't really figured out all the dietary sources yet. You know, it was really in the early stages. I am able to live in a fluoridated house now and have completely clear skin. And I do still okay. shower. <laughs> I just try to limit my time in the shower. I do have a filter, you know, just why not? And I don't take baths. Okay. The major concern here is then more just the consumption of the water and the foods. So where in foods, for example, 
you know, and I actually never even thought about that. What foods <laughs> would, you know, you mentioned some of these, what would be like high fluorinated foods that we should be aware of? Well, first, anything made with fluoridated water. So you're ready to drink beverages or if you go out to eat and have like rice or pasta or mashed potatoes and it's cooked in fluoridated water, it will contain fluoride. So that's one kind of grouping of fluoride foods. And then another grouping, as I mentioned, is the pesticides. It's just fluoride is the active ingredient in this pesticides because it's very toxic. So the most common culprits are raisins and grapes. So like grape really? juice. Yes, incredibly high in fluoride. And it was actually the Europeans who noticed this because they test for these things and they said wine from California wasn't meeting their standards for fluoride. And this was in 1989, which happened to be the same year that veterinarians noticed dogs started dying from grapes and raisins. So in my book, I have this whole section where I was like looking into this theory that they're not dying from raisin poisoning, they're dying from fluoride poisoning. So I really think that's what's going on and the veterinarians haven't looked into it because they don't know that fluoride is the predominant pesticide used on raisins and grapes and that California provides half the world's raisin supply. So that's one to definitely look out for. Grapes, raisins, that includes grape juice, that includes wine from California. It's not used in Washington state or Oregon. So those wines are fine really anywhere outside of this one area of Fresno where they where they grow all these raisins and that's where the wine happens to to be from as well that's high in fluoride. So other areas of California are usually okay. Interesting. That's pretty nuts. And so yeah. obviously this is a total aside but I am an animal lover and I know that a lot of my listeners also are either have dogs or cats or whatever. So would this also suggest that for our fairy friends we should be giving them filtered water where the fluoride has basically been removed. Yes, absolutely. Animals are just so susceptible to fluoride toxicity. And one thing, this applies to animals and people as well, fluoride accumulates in your bones over time. The estimate is that the half-life of fluoride in bone is 20 years. So when you consume fluoride today and it is sequestered in your bones, half of it is still there 20 years from now. That's not really disputed. That's the National Academy of Sciences saying that. It also accumulates when chickens consume fluoride, it accumulates in their bones. So if you're making soup from chicken bones that aren't organically raised, it will be very high in fluoride. Those were actually my worst breakouts were from chicken stock that was all natural, no hormones, no antibiotics, but it wasn't given organic feed. And the the tolerance for these pesticides on chicken feed is ridiculous. It's like 130 parts per million, which is super high. Like water, it's 0.7 parts per million, like the water that you're supposed to drink. So it's really, really high tolerance for this fluoride pesticide that the poultry is consuming in their feed and that accumulates in their bones. And it's passed on to us when we eat not just soup, but anything made with mechanically deboned meat. So like ground Mm. chicken or chicken hot dogs, chicken nuggets, those kinds of things will be very high in fluoride. So I mentioned that with respect to animals because the raw diet is really popular now and they will grind up the bones and put them in. So I never give my dog raw poultry, raw chicken or raw turkey. It's always beef because it tends to be lower in fluoride. And you can find studies from like the environmental working group where they've tested the fluoride content of dog food and it's very high if it contains chicken byproducts. Mm. Well, sorry, everybody. I know it's a natural skin show, but I just like had to ask. I mean, I love my cats and we do filter. We have a special filter that does remove all the fluoride and a lot of pesticides and chemicals and and toxicants and stuff. And that's the water that we also give our, our cats. So for all of you who laugh at me and think I'm crazy, here you go. (laughs) Melissa has just explained why what we do is not nuts. It is actually really important and good for them. So as far as skin is concerned, what I'm guessing here is that the initial advice would be, number one, we want to watch how much we are exposed to fluoride in these high fluorinated foods. Like you're saying, you want to make sure you're getting organic pantry, number one, that you are also, okay, hold on. I'm thinking this through. You want to be get organic grapes, right? Would that be another thing? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning with you. And then also to finding a filter. How can people find, because that's going to be the question is, 
What should they look for when they're looking for a filter? Like, does a Brita do it? I always tell people I think Britas are worthless, but maybe right. they're no, not. Yeah. What, what's your exactly. opinions on they, that? Because I'm sure people ask you this all the time. Yeah, they don't remove filter or fluoride at all. So a Brita okay. won't cut it. Um, you'll really need something a little stronger. Um, reverse osmosis is very reliable at removing fluoride. There are a lot of different kinds of filters that have different media that can remove fluoride. And, and you can see, you know, if they're certified to remove fluoride and how much they remove. So the Berkey is a popular one. They have a special fluoride filter on it. You just really have to be on top of changing it on time because it will lose its effect effectiveness over time. But I, I usually recommend reverse osmosis just because it's the most reliable. Okay, great. Well, that you know, this has been so helpful and eye-opening. And I'm sure anybody listening to this, because this isn't just about skin issues. I think in many respects, people have kids, they have grandkids, they're thinking about themselves long term. And Oftentimes we think, well, the water smells fine. The water tastes fine. It should be safe for me. But we don't realize that, folks, there is a ton of stuff in the water. And even if, so not all municipalities fluorinate their water, but mo- I believe most do. There's a hand. Yeah, 70%. Yeah. So you can go, I'm not exactly sure, but you probably could Google. This was how I found it for a client. Googling does such and such county, (laughs) fluorinate their water and the answer popped up. So that would probably be the easiest way for you to find out if your tap water is fluorinated. But even beyond that, even if it's not, here's the thing. There's drugs that are in the water. So all of those prescription drugs that people flush down the toilet and dispose of inappropriately are in the water. And a lot of those drugs contain fluoride, like Prozac, Paxil, they all contain fluoride in them. So it's just another source of fluoride exposure. Exactly. So this is another way you want to get all that out of the system. You also want to remove any heavy metals. As, As Melissa was saying, she thought maybe it was lead, maybe it was mercury, maybe it was arsenic, but there can be actually high levels of those, especially if you live near farmland land or there's runoff issues. So I would just highly recommend, I also have a Berkey. I really love it. I can put a link to which one I actually use in the show notes. And Melissa, I want to make sure everybody can find you. So I'm going to make sure to put all of your links right in the show notes, but your main website is projectfree.me. Super simple guys. And then her website for, if you want to check out the book is hiddencauseofacne.com. So super easy. But again, if you are driving today, don't worry. It's all in the show notes. I got you covered. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but after the interview with Melissa, my mind was pretty blown. I had not heard all of this about fluoride. I knew about many of the concerns that people have about fluoride and fluorinated water. And this by far took my level of concern to a whole new place. And it underscored why my decision to actually get a really good water filter was the correct decision. And I know for some of you, you're just using regular water filters, the water filter that comes on your refrigerator or a plastic water filter that's similar to those that like just go in the refrigerator and sit there and hang out holding your water. Those are not optimized water filters. And so I hope that Melissa's information can really help you. And especially too, there's a lot of toxic material in our water, unfortunately. And so this can be a great opportunity to start reducing your exposure to not just fluoride, but other chemicals as well. So guys, thank you again so, so much. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. That way you don't miss an episode. If you haven't left a review, go head on over to whatever podcasting platform you use, iTunes, Google, whatever. Leave a review. And don't forget, we're a family. We're in this together. I'm so blessed and excited to be on this journey with you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Music.